All right, Nick Falker, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Fantastic, Brett. Um, it's been a while. Thanks for thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Uh, you've got you got a history in swimming. You've had uh, you've had your own story, had a lot of successes through the way. So I want to kind of talk about all of it. Uh, but where are you coming from right now? Uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, kind of done a, a full circle. This is where I did my undergrad, and um, now I find myself back on the pool deck yeah i mean a pretty interesting story you, you got out of swimming in terms of the the coaching and and the swimming itself for a while and you were on the deck as as a strength coach for many years at cal so i certainly want to talk about that but what ultimately has led you back to coaching and, and back to hawaii again um it's, uh, you know, when people say that uh, it's fate or sort of stars aligned, um, I was at Sam Fries's, uh memorial service uh, just over a year ago, and Sam was my coach in college. Um, uh -huh. I think for all of those listening, you, uh, for the coaches, you love him or you hate him. I think the, the swimmers that swam for him absolutely love him. Um, Sam was a huge part of my swimming success, um, and I think he sparked a lot of what I did on the uh, strength and conditioning side. Um, and I was sitting at his, his memorial service and I just had this, I don't know, I guess voice or twinge or something pulling me saying, you know, how about it's time to get back into coaching? Um, you know, I've been out for a while and um, I'd say a few weeks later, um, you know, uh, Elliot Potasnik, who's now the head coach called me, um, Dan Schemmel had just taken the head job at uh, Stanford. And uh -huh. so Elliot had been promoted from assistant to head coach here. And, um, you know, we knew each other from the days of bridge when he was in New York and then also working with, um, with Anthony Irvin. And, um, you know, I think, uh, he really saw the, uh, you know, potential of, of working together and <laughs> literally called me, I think every day for a few weeks, um, to, you know, get back into coaching and, and come and take the job. Um, and, you know, I had to uh, convince my uh, better half that uh, this was a place to be. Um, you know, we were recently engaged and um, it was quite a big move. Uh, you know, we're living in Texas and looking at um, moving out here. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not the easiest place in the, in the world to up and move to as a, as a couple or family. And, um, you know, I just, I, we took a leap of faith. Um, I did my undergrad here. I loved it. Um, Hawaii is a huge part of, I'd say it's a huge part of me. And, um, you know, even at Cal, we'd wear Aloha shirts on Friday. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's absolutely amazing to be back. The community is amazing. Um, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I just, I, I'd say out of anywhere in the U S this, this really feels like uh, home to me. Well, mate, uh, that's, that's a great story. Great, great to be pulled back into that passion and, and to that love of coaching and swimming. And, and it's awesome to go back to your alma mater uh, to, to work there. So uh, that's super cool. So I'm um, real happy for you, mate. And um, Thank you. And, yeah, so uh, is it challenging right now for you guys in, in Hawaii and, and trying to coach these, these kids for an NCA season that, I mean, what does it look like for you in Hawaii? Um, it's actually, you know, I, I think I still maintain, um, even through, I mean, we've, it's been in the news, we've had some bad lockdowns, but we've still had access to the ocean. Um, we still had access to, you know, parks and being able to walk outside. Um, and I hate to say it, we'll put it this way, but I think it's a good place to be locked down. Um, hmm. you know, you can't, you can't really fault that it's, it's, you know, we spend so much time in the ocean. Um, we do be, you know, even, you know, during a, a normal year, we'll do um, beach workouts on a Saturday. Um, so, you know, in the times that we couldn't uh, be with a team, you know, they were surfing or swimming or, um, you know, at least having touch with the water. So once we got back, um, you know, and the athletic department's been, you know, uh, great in getting us back and allowing us to lift and, you know, uh, you know, we, we testing every day. Um, I think um, Elliot was saying uh, as of the beginning of this week, we've had, um, you know, I think it's zero cases or like, you know, one or two. Um, so it's, I think it's a, you know, it, it's, it's been a good place to be. I, I don't want to, um, you know, um, make 
light of the co- of the virus or COVID, but it, it's been, a, I think, a good place to be in terms of training and having access to uh, outdoors and water. I've never understood uh, Hawaii's ability to be in the NCA <laughs> in the first place, but especially during a COVID situation. But in terms of, um, I don't know much about the program itself, so enlighten me a little bit here. How do you have dual meets? I mean, you're so far away. How do you, like for us in, in Alabama, it was like, just drive a couple hours down the road, there's a team, <laughs> you know, like how on earth do you guys do it? Um, I'm going to take a step back in, in how I even got here. Um, so I transferred in and just to, to add to what you're saying, I didn't know that, you know, Hawaii had a program. Um, and I mean, I think we're in college, uh, pretty much the same time, you know, there was pre Google and internet and we were faxing visas and, you know, stuff to, you know, get visas and all that. Um, I had to look up where the university was. I mean, I knew there were great waves just because of the the surf culture at home and you know paul um who was it i think it was paul thompson was a a world champion um so it's uh you know we knew about that but i didn't know there was an athletic department i think even now there's still some you know i was at junior national winter nationals last year um uh doing some recruiting and there were some parents going man are you at hawaii i didn't know they had a a team and so Mm. you know you know yes um you know, we're in the NCAA, um, you know, during our time here, I mean, we were, you know, we were making finals in, in relays. I think our highest was a fifth place in the 200 free relay. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's been a bit hit and miss, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's obviously somewhere we want to get back. You know, I, I'd love to get back there as an alum and, um, you know, get some, get some of those relays back and have some sprinters back and, you know, have a bit of a, um, presence. I mean, we have a great diving program. Uh, Mike Brown and Anita have done a hell of a job with, um, you know, putting divers in, in finals and stuff. Um, so, you know, that's obviously the goal, you know, with the dual meets, it, it is tough. It's actually better for us to bring teams in um, mm. than for us to go to the mainland. So it is nice to travel, but at the same time, I think, you know, one thing the, the with COVID and with the, the um, I'd say relevance of Zoom now, um, I think, you know, live stream or, or video um, dual meets could be something that could be really interesting. Um, we tried it with Sam and I think it was North Carolina State in 99. Um, we, we did a sort of uh, a virtual meet, but there was no video. Um, but I think it, it's definitely something we could look at. Um, I think it could be interesting. Um, you know, but dual meets, what we'll do is we'll bring teams in during the fall, um, you know, one, maybe two teams at a time and race them. Um, we'll have teams during winter training because it's, it's chock-a-block here. Um, and so we get, you know, we get some good racing in. Man, I couldn't, aff- well, I guess I could at all, but I couldn't afford most things. We had a pretty big budget, but, <laughs> you know, I, I certainly couldn't afford to fly to Hawaii with the team. How do teams afford to do it? How do you afford to bring teams in to even compete? Um, you know, we, we do have a, a program that allows um, like a hospitality. So uh, Outrigger Hotel, which is one of our um, sponsored, you know, uh, department sponsors will help with um, travel, you know, with uh, hotels and, you know, mm. um, depending on the flights, we can help with that too. So it's actually from a budget standpoint, it's, it's better to, to bring teams in. Man, I wish I had known that while I was the head coach at Auburn, I would have, I would have flown across the country to come to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I still, you know, I think, um, you know, when, when you and I are racing, um, I know that the, the Australian national team and Canada would come here a lot during the summers and, you know, especially, um, uh, who's a Gennady, I think would come here with, with a lot of his group. And it, it, I just, to me, it's an amazing place to um, train. I mean, we've got a, mm. a, we've got a weight room on pool deck. We've got everything. We've got the ocean. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal in terms of um, just a training environment. Yeah, I bet. Uh, I'm actually uh, looking to come down there for a holiday uh, in the next few weeks. So I'm, um, Oh boy. Yeah. Let's let's see if we see if we can make that happen. It'll be my first time in Hawaii, so yeah. I'm excited to come check it out. But um listen, before Fantastic. we before we get too far off uh topic into something else, we were talking off camera and um just for those people that are, are what are looking uh, you know at the video right now, it does look like you've kind of been punched in the face a little bit, but uh you you've had um <laughs> you've had some work done on um 
a skin cancer that was on your face. And, and we were talking about kind of the, the reasons why you think uh, you, you may have been affected by this. And just give me your opinion on the whole skin cancer issue with you right now. You know, I think, um, you know, thanks for bringing it up. It's uh, I was joking with the team, you know, when we didn't really make a, a big deal with it with them and you know the guys were asking i was like well you should have seen the other guy he had a lot more work done um so we had a good chuckle with that but um you know growing up in south africa you know um we just didn't put uh sunscreen on you know if you had um spf 5 or 10 i mean it's like you were the you know biggest nerd around um now you're looking at 30s and 50s so i think you know the damage was done as a as a youngster i don't think it was anything um when i came out here um I played a lot of cricket, a lot of rugby. So we were in the sun for, you know, days at a time. Um, you know, we didn't have long sleeves and, and big hats, you know, it was sort of, you know, again, it wasn't uh, the sun, you know, the sun was there, um, but it wasn't really a, a big factor. You know, now I think um, at our age, I mean, for, for those of us who grew up in, in those environments, um, we have to go and get checks. You know, it's one of those things. It's, it's like going to the dentist. I mean, I have a check, um, you know, twice a, twice a year, I go for a full scan, um, you know, just to make sure we're on the safe side. Um, it's, it's definitely something we need to look at and, um, it's, it's easy to miss, but you know, if you pick it up, like everything, you you get it early enough and, um, it's okay. Yeah. And you were telling me that it it didn't even, you didn't even think at first it was a skin cancer. You, you know, you just thought it was just a, some sort of abrasion on your face, but then how did you actually find out that it was cancerous? Um, it, it didn't heal. I mean, it took, you know, after three weeks, you know, you get the sort of like, sometimes you get a, a zit or you cut yourself shaving and, you know, it heals after a couple of weeks, it didn't heal. Um, and, you know, uh, went to have it checked out and they're like, oh, it's, it, you know, it doesn't look too bad. And, um, after a while I said, okay, you know, it, it's time to, you know, have a, maybe a biopsy or something. So they did that. And, um, we went from there. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it did, they didn't quite get it enough. Um, it's called most surgery where they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, um, take a piece of skin, look at it, analyze it. And then, you know, you go back in the waiting room and they'll do it again. And, um, I think first time around, they didn't quite get enough. And so, um, we just clean it out now. How many stitches did you end up having to have on your face there? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm actually getting them out on Thursday, uh, okay. in a couple of days. So it's, um, but, I mean, it, it's, uh, the guy did a really good job. Um, he's actually ironically one of our masters swimmers. Um, we have a big masters club here and he happened to be one of the guys. And I mean, it literally goes from the base of my eye all the way down to, uh, top of my, uh, just below my nose. So, um, yeah, some, some decent work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, it's the reason why I wanted to bring it up. I think it's an important message. I get checked uh, all the time now because I I grew up the same way in Australia, man. It's like you don't put a a hat on when you're a kid. You don't put a shirt on, especially years ago. You didn't. There's obviously new messages that are being put out there now, but I think, um, you know, we, we can, we can forget that at times and and it's an important message to go and get checked and, and check things out. So I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you're uh, back to full health here now, man. And um, thank you. And moving on with life. So that's good. Now, listen, you did grow up in South Africa. So uh, how did you um, get through the ranks in South Africa? I know, I know it's, it's tough uh, to grow up there and, and be a swimmer. It's, you're, not, you're not, you know, as well supported as you may have been in, in like an Australia or, a, or a, you know, the US. But you do end up um, competing for South Africa at the Olympic Games. That's a big deal, man. How did, how did that come about? Um, well, I, I got into swimming because I was a really bad asthmatic. Um, my mother was given the option and not many people know the story. Um, as I think I was a five or seven year old, she's given the option of putting me on a life support machine or trying what was then known as an alternative, um, therapy, which was swimming. Um, I absolutely hated it. I mean, there's very few, uh, even now, but even back then there was very few heated pools in South Africa. So we're outdoors in winter. Um, you know, trying to pull covers on um, a lot of the time. And um, I actually swam to um, so that I could uh, play cricket and rugby. Those were my two big passions. Um, you know, I was given the option of going pro in cricket. Um, I got into one of the academies. Um, so I had the option of going pro in cricket or coming to the U.S. on a swimming scholarship. 
Um, but I'd always wanted to come to the States. I saw a guy called Daryl Cronier who um, swam for Sam Freeze, ironically, as well, um, when he was at LSU. And he came back for one of our nationals and I saw him and I, I said to my mom, I was like, I want to be like that guy. He had, you know, the big purple. Um, I know it's LSU and, and we won't go too far down the, the track mm -hmm. with, the, with uh, you guys there. But, you know, it, it just looked great. He had the, you know, the big mm -hmm. boots and the Parker and I, I, I aspired to be like him. Um, he was, he's from my club team. Um, you know, I think it, you know, Wayne Ridden, my coach, uh, back then has done a hell of a job. I mean, he had Daryl Cronier, um, Brendan Dierdekind, myself. Uh -huh. Um, there's been a lot of guys that have come through that program that have gone on to the States. Um, and he really developed us to move on to the U S I think, um, it goes in waves in, in South Africa where they, they don't want a lot of the, the young talent leaving. Um, and I, I understand it, but at the same time, you know, you've, you have to give them the freedom of choice of, of leaving or staying behind. I mean, we've had some recently, some, some great success, you know, Chad Leclo and uh, Tatiana Schoonmarker. She's done, you know, they've done mm -hmm. a great job, but yeah. at the same time, you can't clip someone's wings. Um, you have to give them the opportunity. And so um, I lived um, in the sticks. I grew up on a farm, so there were not many pools around. Um, my mother would, drive you know sort of an hour each way um morning and afternoon um especially during summers and you know i owe a lot to you know um her driving me and and just you know sort of the sacrifices that she made so swimming was you know i really had the the aspiration of making it but i was never one of like you know like you look at a guy like um ray Nirkling, you know he was breaking age group records from 10 years old he broke literally every stroke, uh, every event, um, he mm -hmm. was in the record books. I, I wasn't, I, you know, I made, I think my first final, maybe at 16 or 17. So I was late coming through. Um, and you know, a late developer, I think the playing multiple sports in, in high school helped. Um, and that, I think that's where Sam and I really saw eye to eye was looking at the athleticism, um, and training athleticism. And then, um, you know, the, 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 the swimming was secondary. Um, and I think not to get too far ahead, but even now in recruiting, that's what I'm looking at is athleticism and genetics, um, you know, and then adding the swimming component to it, to it later. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Well, um, how was your Olympic experience? So how many people were on the South African Olympic team in 2000? I, I have no idea. I mean, I mean, uh, in terms like of swimming, time ago. It, um, it was small. Um, yeah. you know, we had, you know, Penny Haynes, Rake, Brendan, they were leading the charge. Uh, Roland Schoolman was coming through. He was yeah. uh, a little bit younger than me. Um, you know, that was the nucleus of the 2004 team. Um, you know, the, the relay team that that, that um, won the gold and broke the world yeah. record. Um, yeah. You know, and, and aside there, and again, not a very well documented, um, I was actually fifth at our trials and they took two guys that, that I'd beaten. Um, so I didn't make that team. Um, oh, wow. You know, yeah, it's it's been a. Was that I just political? That, that was or what of, was that? Um, you know, probably a conversation for another day. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, you know, there's there's different theories and what happened. You know, Gary Hall tried to take it up as well and and help me out with that. But um, you know, it was it was a tough one to swallow, and I think that really um, uh, sort of put me in the express lane to coaching. Um, mm. You know, sort of I tried to carry on swimming for a while, but. I was, you know, just starting out and in, in a master's program, um, and that's what really, um, you know, put me onto the the coaching pathway. Now, did when did the the strength and conditioning become a passion for you? It always, you know, Brad, it always been a, a passion for me because I was always looking for what I could do. I was always reading, you know, trying to. Um, find what other, you know, not what other people were doing, but what was working. And if you look back at strength and conditioning, um, all the research in the U S especially is, is driven by the bigger companies, Powerade, Gatorade, um, back in the day metrics. And it was all centered around football, basketball, baseball, your, your revenue sports, um, in the U S. And so I was looking to try and, you know, when I, when we're in Australia, I'd always, you know, be asking questions on, you know, what are you guys doing? Um, I've always regarded Australia and New Zealand as sort of the leaders in um, sports medicine and, and exercise physiology. You know, mm -hmm. you look at um, what you guys have done from, you know, um, 
every sport, cricket, rugby, AFL, um, you name it, you know, it's you guys are the leaders. I, I, I maintain, um, you know, so I was always asking about that when I was racing, I was looking for an edge to catch up. I mean, I was, you know, I think about a, a buck 80 in the shower. Um, you know, if I turn sideways, I, you know, I'd, I'd disappear. Like, so I was always looking, I, I realized I needed to put on some weight, but I, I wanted to do it the right way. Um, and so, you know, Sam sort of ignited that in me, but uh, I, I felt like it was, it was still a bit, you know, generic where, you know, Andy Dykert was our assistant coach and he was very passionate and had a background, but I wanted to take it one step further. I wanted to go, you know, well, if you're a miler, you need to do something different than a sprinter, than a breaststroker, than a flyer, that, you know, long axis versus short axis strokes. We can't all do the same. Um, you know, as a cricketer, your opening bowler is not doing the same as your batsman or your outfielder. So trying to, you know, I, I kind of realized there was something that wasn't quite there. Um, and, you know, in talking with, you know, Mike Bottom, when I started out at Cal, it's like, I, I've got to give Mike a huge, um, I'd say shout out or just thanks because he's the one that took a risk going to the administration saying, Hey, let's try this with a, putting a swimmer in someone with a swimming background into strength and conditioning. Um, and they, they, it was, you know, my first year with the men's team at Cal was a trial year. Um, and then, you know, that worked pretty well. And then it became, you know, men's water polo. And then, um, you know, you know, Terry like what was, was going on. And so then women's swimming joined. And so after three years, I had all four of the aquatics teams. Um, and, but again, doing very different things for four different coaches and um, different needs. So I'd say getting, you know, getting back to it, I've always, I've always been fascinated at looking for what's now known as, you know, marginal gains. Um, I think that's a very um, cliched, uh, cliche to, so to speak. But if you look at team sky, that that's why they've succeeded, um, you know, and, I like going to other sports. I mean, I follow rugby a lot. So I'm looking at what those guys are doing and, and, you know, energy systems are the same throughout. Um, so how do you take that and apply it to um, swimming? Because to me as a sprinter, I didn't, I really didn't see the value in going, you know, just a bunch of yardage, but at the same time, too much sprinting without that backup and without the strength didn't make sense. So it was always looking for, kind of what the missing element was. And to me, it, it had to start with strength and conditioning and what we're doing outside of the pool. So much interesting stuff there, but in terms of just your um, lucky break at Cal and, and Mike Bottom helping you out, getting that break, but how much experience did you have up until that point? Um, you know, I'd done some work um, here at, at uh, Hawaii before I left. So, you know, I'd done, I'd, you know, obviously, Followed a lot of what Sam had done and I did some work in my fifth year. Um, and then I, you know, um, I went back to South Africa for a while and, and worked with some triathletes and some, some youngest, you know, uh, athletes coming through. So it was quite an experiment. You know, I was still very young in, in my, um, uh, in my career. And, you know, I think that's where I've got to sort of tip my hat to Mike going, okay, let's, this is going to be experiment. It was an, a collaboration but how can we make this evolve and grow? Um, you know, I was, I was in a, a, um, a master's program in kinesiology. So, I mean, I was burning the candle at both ends, staying up at night, trying to find, you know, what was working, where the research was, and it just wasn't a lot. Um, so, you know, it was sort of trial by fire of looking in. And we started off cautiously. It wasn't, you know, we're going to go and, you know, get guys massively strong or, you know, it was, let's look at the injury prevention first. What's the number one thing that is keeping swimmers out? Okay. Well, it's shoulder issues. So where mm -hmm. does that start? And so we're just sort of, you know, peel back the onion layer from there of, um, you know, what's, what are the big issues and how can we debunk them? How can we, you know, get rid of them? And then we can really get into the nitty gritty. Wow. Awesome stuff. And I'm, I'm still super fascinated in that, in that line of thinking we're going to go there, but um, how did, how did the conversation even come up then with, uh, with Mike? Like how <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out how you got this job. Now, listen, you did an incredible job once you were there. And the, I mean, the, the, the record speaks for itself in terms of the championships you won at Cal or helped win um, with the, with the amount of athletes that you've worked with, but how did you get this job in the first place? What was the conversation with Mike? When did it start? 
You know, I think we were both, um, I, I don't know when it, when it would have started, but I think we were both looking for, I was looking for an edge, um, you know, because I was still doing some some racing as well. Um, I was looking for an edge. He was he was really frustrated with, and I think as, as a head coach, you can understand this. Every head coach in NCAA, and I'm sure the ISL are going to find this too, but every head coach is frustrated with the revolving door of strength and conditioning coaches mm-hmm. that you have in your program. Now at Auburn, you guys were fortunate with PK. Yep. Um, and he was a guy that I lent on very heavily to start with going, okay, what's he done talking to people that have been with him? You know, th- the way that the collegiate system is set up is that, ob- and it- it's, it's nothing against it, but it's, you know, uh, American football drives the revenue. So yep. you start with your, head football coach and from then he hires his assistants and then from there you get you know um, male and female strength coaches who are then assigned to your non-revenue slash olympic sports and if someone's had a background in tennis they might get men's or women's tennis and then it's like oh who wants swimming and you know everyone's sort of looking out the window going i don't want swimming and so you know they get a, a grad assistant or you know someone who's new so mike was frustrated because here you have the the U.S.'s um, number one sport in medal halls mm-hmm. getting given to grad assistants or coaches who don't want to use them or yep. coaches who are getting pulled away in the fall like on a on a Friday you're getting pulled away by football because football is playing on a Saturday so the issue is is almost like it's a it's a systemic issue in in college because everything is driven towards um, football. And if football is not your main revenue sport, then it's basketball. So in the spring, when it's uh, swimming's main competition um, schedule, you've got conference and NCAAs. If you have a, a basketball coach um, that's doing your strength and conditioning, they're getting pulled away for basketball and March Madness and they're traveling. So, yep. you know, their, their emphasis is on, is on basketball. So, Mike had a frustration. I was, had like a, a need that I was trying to look at going, mm-hmm. how do we change this? And we, it was just a, you know, we came together at the same time and um, you know, he took a risk and thankfully the administration followed him. Okay. Um, but, we okay, were okay, very fortunate in, in terms of like um, from a budget standpoint, at the same time, Cal had an endowment from what was known as the big four. It was four families that came together to endow the four aquatics programs um, to make sure that, you know, uh, men's water polo stayed around because it was there were a lot of teams getting cut and so they endowed that so you know a big part of my um salary was cut or starting out um was coming from that so you know look that helped there was a lot of things that fell into place um but again you know a paid position for aquatics was not really the done thing so i think we definitely paved the way there for a lot of programs now that are having uh strength and conditioning coaches that are working primarily with swimming, but then also, you know, other sports and that are traveling with swimming. Um, you know, I traveled a lot with the, both swimming and water polo teams. Um, and I think that was a huge part of um, how things changed and how it developed. Um, so, yeah, mm-hmm. it was, it was, um, it was good timing. It's funny to say that you kind of paved the way just 15 years ago, you know, like it's ridiculous, <laughs> you know? it's, uh, uh, but you're right. You did, you did. And then look, um, in, in uh, appreciation of PK and, and the stuff that he did at Auburn, you're right. He was doing some phenomenal things. And, uh, uh, but to, to see someone like you come along and fight for a position, you must've almost been kind of like the, the black sheep in the family at Cal. I mean, how were you treated <laughs> originally in terms of like, all right, here's this kid come in. He doesn't have a lot of experience. He's getting paid. It's a paid position now. So we can't mess with him. Like we want to, we can't move him where we want to move him. I mean, were you treated okay at first? Um, I definitely um, was reminded what my place was, okay. um, that I was only with swimming and water polo. Okay. Um, you know, I, I still, you know, my office was in the strength and conditioning uh, in the weight room. So it wasn't like I was, you know, off the side with, with you know, uh, hanging out in the swimming offices the whole time. You know, I stocked the fridge, I cleaned the floor, we cleaned the equipment. Um, but you know, I made the mistake of showing up in the weight room. I think not, not to actually coach, but just coming in my first day and I had sandals on, um, bad mistake. And, uh, you don't do that in a weight room. So, 
you know, it was, it was, it took a while, you know, I definitely had to fight for my spot. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, every year there was, you know, like validating what I was doing. You know, we weren't doing enough strength work. We weren't doing enough power work. Um, But as the injuries decreased and as we started getting a little bit more success, um, you know, it definitely helped. Awesome. Well, that's what I wanted to know. I'm starting to make a lot more sense now. I'm like, okay, just knowing the ins and outs of NCAs and, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, I mean, you had to fight for it. That's good. It's good to know, man. And, and yeah. you did. And, and not only did you fight for it, but you proved it over time, which is amazing as well. So that's the part now that I'm really interested in, is like, how did we, how did we establish success now? So, <laughs> so what was your philosophy early on? Like if you're, if you're trying to get away from the norm of what was happening, what was what was happening and what were you trying to get away from and how did you change it? You know, I wanted to get away from the stereotype of you just got to put a bunch of weight on on someone's back and, you know, it, that everything that, you know, if you've got a hammer, everything's a nail, mm-hmm. um, you know, and every lift you have to start is with um, a barbell. You know, we spent... Um, and it, it, look, it took, it took, it took a while. Like I was definitely biting my head against a wall for a while. Um, but it, you know, getting the buy-in from the athletes helped. I think, you know, coming from a swimming background, it helped. Um, but you know, everything was a progression. If you look at a swimming athlete back then coming into college, they didn't have a lot of experience on dry land. Things have changed now. I mean, you know, with, with guys going 19, coming out of high school in the 50, things have changed. Um, you know, with girls going 21, low in the 53 mid to low it's like things have changed they have a background in in dry land and strength and conditioning but you know back then you know people coming into the weight room hadn't lifted a weight so we had to stabilize them first i couldn't load their spine Mm -hmm. with squats we had to teach them a squat we had to teach them the rdl um it look i made a lot of mistakes um i'll be the first one to admit that you know every every strength coach has to test the athletes when they come in, they want a baseline number to go, this is where we started. And then look at what a great job I did. I got them stronger at the end of the year because that's what keeps their job. My test and my job was based on how fast they went from A to B. And then sometimes A to B multiple times in the mile or the 400 IM and without any injuries. That was my test. That's what I said as my criteria was I'm going to have, few injuries at the end of the season than when we started and um, people are going to go faster. You know, it's not how much they lift. I really wasn't interested in how much they lift. Obviously as guys like, you know, Nathan Adrian came through and um, you know, some of the other sprinters, yes, we had to get them stronger because the sport was changing. But um, for me, it was teaching them how to squat, how to do a lunge. Um, The biggest mistake I made and for any strength coach listening, do not try and test female athletes on pull-ups if they have no background in it, because all you're going to do is chase them out of the weight room. And I can tell you exactly what their testing number is. It's going to be a big goose egg. It's going to be a zero. And it took me probably three, maybe four years to figure that out. And so we had to come up with a different test for a pull, something that would get their buy-in and then we could show them progression. Mm. Um, You know, but the standard in strength and conditioning is you have to do a back squat, an RDL, um, sometimes a deadlift to get your power number, um, a clean and a pull-up. Well, 90% of the athletes, 99% coming in hadn't, hadn't done most of those exercises. So why am I testing them? A test is to try and figure out where you are and where you're going. Like I can tell you, we were, we were at ground zero. There was absolutely nothing. Most of them had never done a squat. So that all I was going to do was injure them by trying to test them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, at the same time, at that point, we're also, you know, Cal wasn't, they were sort of in the top five, sometimes eight, you know, trying to get into the top five and stay there. So it was a different type of athlete than what they have now. Um, so again, it's, you know, you're looking at recruiting you're looking at athletes. And so there, there was a lot of different factors we had to look at, but the main one was why are we testing them in exercises that they have no experience in and we're just going to hurt them. Um, and so that was sort of, again, you know, I'm sort of unraveling things and peeling back the onion was what is our base going to be? And, you know, where are we going with it? So setting those sort of, I don't like the word KPIs, but setting the pillars and and achievables down the road of what can we do if we're not testing pull-ups? Okay. Let's do an inverted row. And what is our number going to be? How are we going to get there? 
and keep them injury free. Nice. I love it, mate. Who were the first athletes that you were working with at Cal that kind of gave you that buy-in and that belief and backed you? Uh, you know, can you remember about that, that far back? Um, you know, I'd say probably the, you know, we had uh, Enrique Barbosa, um, you know, Caleb Bro. that was some of the breaststrokers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to get called out on this because, because there's been a <laughs> Sorry. lot. Um, yeah. I can't remember. You know, either. No, it, it's fine. You know, they, like I would say the first real impact class, you know, we had some, indif- I mean, Dewey Draganya, like yeah. there's um, Milo Ka- uh, Kavich. Yeah. Um, we had, we had some, um, you know, we had some studs, but we didn't have the team. Mm-hmm. And that's what we were really looking for was, um, you know, on the, on the woman's side going from like one to 18 at NCAAs on the guy side, you know, one to 18 and, you know, getting, you know, that getting as many people there as we could. Um, yeah. that's what we were looking for. Yep. Now at Auburn, uh, PK was kind of famous for helping build the team mentality through his circuits. Were you, uh, looking at that and doing anything like that at Cal or how were you building, the team mentality with, with the, the athletes that you had there? You know, we were doing, um, I think for, for one, um, I think punctuality was the first place to start. Um, and we definitely had some issues with, you know, if we starting at six, um, I was close. If we we're starting at 6am, we were closing the weight room at five fifty-five. Um, the expectation was if you want to be a championship team, you show up early, you do your, um, you know, if there was any stretching or releases or anything, you know, if you had some, some injury issues, you would take care of those ahead of time, not on my time. And so the punctuality was number one. Were and you locking people out? Say, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. I, I took some flack my first couple of years and, you know, even with men's water polo. Um, but again, I had... I was fortunate enough where Kirk Everest, the coach, was buying in um, to that. When they they instituted it amongst the team, they came up with a street a three strike policy, um, and the team decided that. So it's just you know before we go down an NCA violation issue, the team decided that that um, they. I mean, one of the most uh, I'd say my first championship was actually with men's water polo. And, oh, okay. Um, yeah, and so they there that was a roster that could start on any team, even national team in the, in the U S but they could never pull it together amongst themselves. They would fight each other and have like, literally, I mean, there was a fist fight in practice multiple times. And so our whole thing was to get the buy-in from them. And they came up with a, a three strike policy. And one of them was punctuality and holding your teammates accountable. And I mean, literally dragging guys that were still in bed, dragging them through the door because if they didn't make it, you know, it was sort of like first strike was, you know, miss a practice. Then it was miss a, uh, a day or a week or whatever it was. And then on strike three, the team decided you were done. Like that, that was it. Mm, um, wow. And you would voluntarily take yourself. But I mean, it, it was just that kind of quality talent. And they came together and um, beat a, a USC team that they had no business beating um, mm. because USC was such a, a quality team. So, you know, the, the punctuality was number one, um, you know, and I think uh, New Zealand rugby do a good job of this where it's like sweep the sheds where the it's not the we, we try to instill a thing where it's not the freshman's job to clean up at the end of workout. If, you know, it's the seniors lead, the captains lead and everyone follows because the captains are and the seniors are leaving and then the juniors and the sophomores are coming through after that. So. Um, we also made a decision that if we were going to have a championship, it started in the weight room. It started with discipline It started with uh, the commitment there. And then just the, um, the, the discipline of cleaning up and it's not, Hey, freshmen go clean up. It's we start with the leaders and then that trickles down to the, the, the younger male and female, you know, athletes coming through. So it was sort of a top down uh, approach. Nice. I love it, mate. Love it a lot. Uh, when did you first start working with Dave Durden? Dave came in, I want to say 2008 or nine. Um, okay. I, I believe, I, I think that's again, um, I, I have a bit of a foggy memory, but um, you know, that was a class of, you know, Nathan was just coming back. Um, he had taken the Olympic waiver. Dom Maitri was in, um, you know, that was a, that was a solid team. Um, 
And, you know, again, getting back, sorry, to your question about the, the circuit, you know, we had, we'd all heard about PK circuit and, you know, how great that was. And that was the backbone of a lot of what, of Auburn success. So, mm-hmm. you know, when Dave came in, obviously we decided we were going to do the same thing. Um, not, not, you can't copy what someone else has done. Sure. You've got to you've got to make it fit your environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but we started that where you know the first six weeks we had um, we set it up um, and you know there was no secret to it. It was you know we we were looking at exercises that were physically challenging, but we had one that we came up with that you are literally sitting on a physio ball or a Swiss ball for the allotted time, and if your feet touch, then we all start again. And so it was it was more of a mental challenge than a physical challenge but that's what ncaa's is ncaa's is the team that hits a speed bump and can rebound better than anyone else um, which is the team that can disqualify a relay or have someone not make you know someone get ninth in the morning and rebound and their teammates pick them up that's what we were looking for yeah i noticed uh one of the areas that that durden and yourself kind of picked up on pk was was actually being at some of the big meets um you know pk would always come to ncaa secs ncaa's and you know some of those other big meets with us uh he'd be there from start to finish and i saw you know from the moment you you started with with Dave Durden, you were, you were there, you're carrying bags, you're filling up water bottles, you're, you're putting, you're helping (laughs) guys, you know, whatever it is, build goggles, you know, you're doing it, you're doing it all. So like, there's the strength coach as part of the swim team. And, and it just looked like, you know, you guys had figured out how to be a a tight unit and, and um, you know, you could tell from a distance that it was, it was working, you know, and, and there was certainly buy-in and, um, I don't know how long that that took you to evolve with Dave, but it seemed like Dave had just fully embraced you and the team had fully embraced you by the time you guys were starting to make a really big impact. Yeah, you know, we, we started the travel, um, you know, I was traveling with, um, you know, when Mike and Nort were head coaches uh, or coaching as well. Um, but, you know, and actually, <laughs> funny story, Skip Kenny thought I was actually, uh, that Cal had brought a towel, boy, a towel boy along because, you know, I was putting towels behind the block and then I'd, I'd you know, I'd, I'd dry it off. And it was just something extra that, you know, I would really have appreciated if I was racing. And he, he actually asked them who the towel boy was. <laughs> um, it was it was kind of funny. He thought because it was at, it was at Pac-12s, he thought I'd driven down from, um you know berkeley and you know being there as a towel boy but you know we one of the things we 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 yeah it's kind of funny to think about um it's uh we stripped down the our processes um from the get-go in all in all four teams um men's and women's swimming men's and women's water polo and we looked at how do we make the most out of everything we're doing how many swimmers do you know i mean from when you're racing and as a coach where you had the best year training and then you travel to a meet and the wheels fall off Mm -hmm. or they get sick or they lose weight or something happens. So again, we went through everything and identified that travel was one of the biggest issues. And so with men's water polo and even the women, we, there's a lot of in-state travel in California. So instead of flying to Southern California and getting stuck in, you know, traffic at, you know, landing at sort of one, two in the afternoon, getting stuck in traffic, driving, driving to UCLA or USC or Pepperdine. Um, you know, it's, uh, we would look at, you know, how do we change the academic schedule, which is not easy at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Um, so that their Fridays we would, you know, and the men were playing in the fall. So we'd lighten up their fall schedule, you know, crank it up a little bit in the, in the, in the spring. But how do we get their schedule so they could leave at 9 a.m., arrive at 10, 1030, pick up the van, skip, skip traffic, um, you know, go and have some food, get to USC, UCLA, wherever it was, have their practice um, and then, you know, go and have dinner, you know, before. Otherwise, they were getting in, not getting pool time, you know, you know, getting caught at dinner late at night, staying up to watch video of the, the team until 11 o'clock at night. And then getting up at eight o'clock in the morning, trying to play a big game. So we, we took all that back and said, okay, how do we, you know, if we're going to USC, both, you know, water polo teams stay at the same hotel, use the same flight, use the same car company. So we all know, um, you know, have 
sandwiches waiting for us there and go to the same sandwich, you know, just replicate stuff that works. It, it wasn't rocket science, but, you know, you have these high performance directors coming in, making quarter million a year doing the same stuff. We just, sim we just try to simplify and control as many variables as we could. And that went forward onto both swimming teams as well, where, you know, if we had a, if we were flying to Minneapolis and we had to go through Salt Lake City, we would find a, a sandwich shop in the airport, put in the order, and the, there were you know sandwiches and and water bottles were waiting there for the, you know whichever you know men's or women's swimming team was coming through, and so they had food. They weren't you know um, they weren't getting um, hungry and and you know losing weight on on a travel uh, trip. Um, you know we had a fortunate enough to have a direct of ops that would travel ahead and you know um he or she would you know make sure that the vans were ready and that had been taken care of so we weren't sitting for an hour at the at the you know at the at the car rental just looking at every step of the process and and re and re redefining it or redoing it um and just controlling it you know i mean you know then as assistant coaches going out to, at nights and, you know, making sure that there was food and all that kind of stuff for the next day and, you know, making sure that everything was taken care of. So all the swimmers had to do or water polo players had to do was think about competing. All the other stuff, all the stuff in the head was gone. Like we, we took care of that. Mate, that all that stuff is, is not really in the job description of a strength and conditioning coach. I mean, that's going above and beyond, no. you know, that's, uh, that, that, that's dealing with a lot of psychology as well, to be quite honest, is just management exactly. of, uh, of team psychology, right? Yeah, you know, and, and uh, part of my master's degree was sports psych. So um, I did like a double, I did biomechanics and sports psych. So I wanted to look at the mechanics of things and then mm -hmm. also, you know, what goes on up here. Because, um, I mean, you know what it's like in the ready room of the 53. Um, it's your, your season can be done in, in five minutes. Um, all those hours you put in can fly out the window. Or, I mean, we had it happen with, you know, during the tech suit era with, with Nathan. He put his suit on. I think it was at Worlds or Pampac Trials in, um, I can't remember where it was. But, you know, um, put a hole in, like that mm -hmm. big into the suit. So we had to scramble and get it put on. I, you know, I traveled with Dominic Maitri to his trials in Switzerland. Um, and he, the same thing, suit blew out. Well, how do you calm them and have everything ready to go? I mean, that the stuff we just, we rehearsed and rehearsed mm -hmm. and rehearsed. And um, I think that's another thing, you know, like you hear strength coaches are now, you know, performance directors or they performance this and performance. I mean, we were just doing that. That was, mm -hmm. it was, it wasn't a requirement. It wasn't a job description. We did it because that's what the athletes needed. Yeah. Uh, awesome stuff, mate. I love it. We, we certainly got that from, from PK too. We, we were very lucky and PK's still there. Oh, for one, of the, sure. one of the things I will say though, is, is uh, PK in my mind got a little bit disillusioned over time in terms of um, the rules that were coming in and the things that, that we could yeah. do. And, um, kind of the way that college athletics was changing. I mean, uh, anytime there was an incident in another sport, it would, it would trickle down into what we were doing, you know, and it, even if it didn't relate to our sport. So I know that uh, PK is still there to this day. I don't think he works with, with swimming and diving anymore, but um, which is a shame, but, but I, I, I could shame. tell he was just getting disillusioned over time in terms of the things that he felt like he could do and he couldn't do. And it was very frustrating. Did you notice changes uh, throughout your time at Cal and the things that you were allowed to do with the athletes? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, even, even now it's changed a lot, but I, I was just noticing, um, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, we became the enemy. Mm. Uh, we became, if something was going wrong, you know, it was like, Oh, we can't let strength and conditioning do that because they're going to hurt them. But yeah. Hey, go ahead and go, you know, 20 hours in the pool or go 20 hours on the, on the field. But if strength and conditioning gets hold of them, um, they're going to be the ones that, that hurt them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to be certified. We have to do all that stuff. Most strength and conditioning coaches now have a master's degree. Um, so, you know, there's some education behind it. Um, but there was definitely, a, you know, like we can't push the athletes too hard. And I don't mind. I'll go out and let me say this. Like, you know, over the years, I've done a lot of work with um, – 
um, you know, special operation units like the Navy SEALs and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. it's, it's when you understand what the human body can go to, like, I'd never want to take a swimmer there, but if it's, it's, they've done studies and they, they put, you know, like electric stem and all kinds of stuff all over them. Mm-hmm. They, in talking to the guys in Coronado, which is where they do a lot of their, or where they do buds, um, yep. they've, they've taken, they've brought in the top scientists and worked them and they maintain that at when they pushing a lot of their, their guys to literally pass out, puke, do all that stuff, you, you'll be, the human body is at about 60 to 65% of capacity. Mm. Um, and the brain shuts down and said, that's enough. So we're not even getting close to that, but we can't really push. And I look, I'm not, I'm not here to get on a, on a soapbox, but over the years, it became a thing where it's like, Ooh, the strength coach is working me too hard. They want me to squat too much or deadlift. And so yeah. it became a thing of like, we just, we just got, you know, they, they literally put barriers around us and it, it, it's even now it's tough. Um, yeah. Really that's is. that's what I noticed. I, I absolutely noticed that with PK, the frustration level would just get higher and higher yeah. each year, and just felt like he just couldn't do things. And and it just seemed like we were getting away from what we were successful at. And and to be quite honest, as the head coach of the team, it was frustrating for me because I. I could see the changes in PK, the strength coach from the guy that used to coach me to the guy he is now is like, to me, it was like, he was a shadow of himself and, and it wasn't his fault entirely. It was, it was a lot of it was coming from administration and other sports. Like I said, it was extremely frustrating for me. And then I would have alum come back and say, why isn't PK doing this? Why isn't PK doing that? Is that, you know, that would blame me in a way like, are you, you changing everything, Brad, you're changing the way we used to do things. I'm like, no, you don't understand the way that we used to do things is changed. It's gone. It's like, you can't do that stuff yeah. anymore. So, um, they no, were having a hard time with it. it. It's, it's in every, it's in every sport at every level. I mean, you look at the NFL, like they, the, the players association is trying to ha- make sure they have fewer, you know, fewer off season practices. Well, yeah. is a direct correlation of increase in hamstring injuries. Um, I mean, it's like, at what point do you want to look at? We have to, practice i'm not saying go crazy but there's a certain amount of time we have to spend in preparing the body to perform and if you take that away and you try and say oh that's too many hours or it's this or it's that it's going to hurt the athlete and Mm -hmm. yes i understand there are some teams there are some programs that run a, a very fine line but at the same time we have to spend a certain amount of time if you have an injury getting you back to where it returned to play there is a certain amount of time we have to spend in the weight room to prepare the body to handle the rigors of the, you know, what's coming in, in the, whatever the training environment is or the competitive environment. If we take that away, we're actually doing our student athletes and our, any, any athlete you work with a disservice as a yeah. coach, yeah. we are, we are, we are actually putting them in harm's way when we don't prepare them the way we should. And I'm not saying go and run like, you know, suicides and all that kind of stuff all day. I'm saying from a, from a scientific perspective or a, from periodization, if we don't periodize them correctly and prepare them and recover them, and that's a big part is recovery. If we don't recover them enough, um, we are putting them in, in harm's way. Yeah. Well said, mate. Good message. And now listen, you have uh, got to spend a lot of time with some of the elite of elite coaches in terms of Terry McKeever, um, and, uh, and Greg Meehan was there as well, uh, for a yeah. long period of time, um, Dave Durden. So, um, maybe what did, what did, what did you learn from, from them, uh, that you could share with us that, that you're maybe using in your coaching now? Um, you know, it's, I'd say all coaches, I mean, we had you know, the different head coaches. I mean, I'll start with Nort. He was, he was mm-hmm. there, uh, when I first started, I mean, what an amazing mind, um, you know, just from preparing Beyondy to go as fast as he did to some of the, you know, the flyers and breaststrokers. I mean, when he took over the breaststroke group, he did a phenomenal job, um, you know, with them at NCAAs. Um, you know, Mike Bottom, same thing, just thinking out of the box. And I think, you know, what from Mike's standpoint was, you know, looking at every, every swimmer differently, there was no one mm. size fits all. And I yeah. appreciated that. And just the care he had for the, for the athletes and their mm. development. I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's just, 
you know, you can see the success he's had at Michigan. And then, you know, Dave came in and, you know, Dave's preparation, it's, it is second to none. I have never seen, and I don't know if I ever will, someone prepare like Dave does. I mean, mm. he, wow. I mean, the sets he writes, the, it's just, it was a, it was an honor to be able to work with him and Greg. I mean, you look at the, the two head Olympic coaches for yeah. the U S were yeah. Greg and Dave, and I got to work, you know, side by side. I mean, we would literally meet every, and one of the things that I tried to set up was a, a meeting every week for an hour with every team to go through the roster. And, and so that, you know, improve the communication. We mm. had sports medicine in there, academics, strength and conditioning, and then the coaches. And at, when we had a director of ops, they would come in too. So we were all on the same page, but to work with Dave and Greg and look at their level of, of, um, of just uh, preparation. And then you bring in, you know, Yuri, um, you know, Yuri, I mean, just phenomenal. Um, I just love, like, I'd say, you know, Dave and Yuri, like a little bit of like yin and yang and just in, in how they worked off each other and how they would re recruit. And like Yuri's attention to detail, you know, Dave was very good at preparing and, you know, detail, but Yuri had just, he has like a sixth sense to, to be able to work with athletes and, and, you know, um, he's very calming. And I think, you know, the work he did with, you know, Tom Shields and guys like that was very calming in, in, in giving them reassurance. Um, you know, and then you look at, you know, Terry, I mean, she's just a stalwart. I mean, she was a, in terms of someone who's had to fight for their position in U S coaching and just on the world stage. And some of the, I'd say the, um, uh, risk she's had to take in terms of, you know, getting away from yardage and into more speed work. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, sort of poo pooed what she was doing, but she took a risk and she's very into movement and, and, and athleticism and, and, you know, um, working with Kristen as well. Like Kristen, uh, um, was just a phenomenal recruiter. Um, you know, and just, you know, the lengths they went to on recruiting. Um, I mean, yeah, it just, it's, it's really opened my eyes for, you know, the, the position I'm in now because 90% of what we do is the recruits we get. Um, and I, I'll never forget this one quote. We used to do these um, round tables at Cal for a while with the national championship coaches where it was like, you know, brown bag, you bring your, you know, bring your lunch and sit around a table with, you know, some of the top coaches and Jack Clark, who's won, I don't know, I think 25 national championships in rugby at Cal I'll never forget the saying he said, you know, if you miss your number one recruit and you don't get that guy or girl that year, they'll beat you once a year, one day a year, they will beat you when you match up with them, maybe twice. He said, but if you get the wrong recruit, they beat you every single day, every <laughs> practice, every hour of the day. And I know you chuckling because you can understand it. You get the wrong recruit and they will destroy your team mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. never forget that yeah i had a couple of those myself so <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, you know, I know that it's, feeling. It's, it's one thing recruiting you know talent and speed yeah. and times mm -hmm. but you've got to look into what they're going to bring to the team and yeah. I, I think that in all the coaches that's one thing they really looked at of what are they going to bring to the team culture are they going to make the team better by the time they leave or is it all good is it going to be all about them yeah. Well, uh, above anybody that you mentioned, uh, they're all great. But in terms of what Dave Durden's done there with the Cal men's team, yeah. especially just recently, I mean, great men I know a lot of them. I got to, I yeah. got to meet a lot of them through the ISL and, and being on the LA current, uh, and a lot of good girls too. Don't get me wrong, but the, the, yeah. the men's team, what Dave's done, they're very, very impressive uh, for both Terry and Dave, uh, incredible stuff. So, um, mate, I appreciate that. It's it's tough uh, when you've got great mentors like that. It's tough to then follow yeah. in their footsteps a little bit, isn't it? You know, Brett, I, I'll I'll say this to them too. And uh, Berkeley or Cal is not an easy place to coach. Um, I, I mean, no, I'm not taking anything away from the department. It is not an easy, or it might have changed. Look, I haven't been there in in um, seven or eight years. But at the time, we had one pool. We had a small weight room that hadn't been redone like it is now, um, and it was just a it was just a, a tough place with you know campus and 
or academics working with athletics and um, it, it's and so I think what I'm where I'm going is for what they've done yeah. with the challenges they've the hoops they've had to jump through wow yeah. yeah I take my hat off to them yeah absolutely absolutely no doubt about that um, man I get a lot of people telling me who I should have on the podcast uh, every now and then and and I love it I, it's always good information <laughs> but uh got a message from Anthony Irvin and he was telling me that I should get Nick Falker on the on the podcast why do you what, what can you tell me Don't about you. Anthony um, we go way back, I guess. I think my first, uh, um, recollection of Tony was, uh, what looking at this scrawny guy in lane four going, how's this guy, you know, how's he, how did he qualify first in the 50 free and then watching his, um, his feet while he literally destroyed everyone. Um, you know, it was, it was impressive. So that was a humbling moment. Um, you know, but then I think to, work alongside him you know when he came back i think it was 2010 or 11 um and you know what he you know what he decided to do and um you know it was a challenge as a from the strength and conditioning side um getting him back to you know where he got to um you know we didn't have a lot of time um he had a shoulder injury that was um left over from his motorcycle accident um he was i don't know i mean a buck 50 maybe he, i mean it, it was he was not in good shape. Um, mm. So we had to sort of retrain a lot of that. I know, you know, listening to some of the stuff John T. John T. Skinner's talked about is from a neural standpoint, how to retrain, you know, some of the, the things that he needed. Mm. Um, and, you know, I was very honest with him. I was like, you know, is this going to be a long-term thing? Um, or was it a flash in the pan? Um, and I don't want you to compare yourself to the other guys in the room. So for the first probably year or so, he actually didn't lift a lot with a lot of the other guys. Um, he was training with Terry and the, and the, and the women's team, which I think was a, a great way to come back. Um, but at the same time, you know, and this is where I think a lot of strength coaches need to, you know, have the confidence to do this, where, you know, once he started training with the guys and he was, you know, in the same room as, let's say, a Nathan, who's putting up 130 pounds in, in dumbbell bench press in each hand. Mm -hmm. um you know it's and you look across the room and you know i said tony was at 75 or 80 and I, i'm not saying this in, in any bad way but that's what he needed that's what he needed so to to give him the confidence to go you know what you're both trying to go you know 21 and and make the team and you know go whatever time they were trying to go in the 100 um but this is what you need right now um and getting him to buy in and trust that that was, that was huge um, because not a lot of athletes will do that. When you look across the room and there's a guy, you know, pulling 80 kilos on pull-ups and you're not quite there and saying, well, he's doing that. I'm racing him. How's it going to work? But, yeah. you know, strength to weight ratio comes into it and just, you know, understanding, you know, different body types and age, you know, different age groups and, and requirements. I mean, it, it definitely is a, an individualized, um, programming perspective yeah well oh, mate he uh he recommended you come on the podcast now you got to get back to him and and recommend he comes on the podcast we need we need to hear from tony over yeah man. that would be awesome we do yeah he can't uh you can't hide away for too long um <laughs> so you know it it'd be good to have him on it'd be awesome man i'd love to chat with him uh incredible mind yeah. but uh so are you uh this has been awesome uh listen really happy that you're back in swim coaching mate and uh, good to see you it's um, awesome happy and uh let's uh, hopefully we can catch up in hawaii in a few weeks for sure but um mate best yeah. of luck with the season they're in good hands down there that's for sure uh gr great experience you've been working with the, some of the best athletes in history some of the best coaches in history and and now you're gonna make your own mark again so uh good to see you back nick appreciate it mate Thanks, Brett. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be on here, with, especially with some of um, you know, the guests you've had. I, I really appreciate it. Yep. No worries, mate. All right. Uh, get healthy uh, with the, the skin and uh, see you soon. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. See you. See you, Cheers. See you mate. Bye.